Mark Strong is here. He stars as Eddie Carbone, the tragic protagonist, in Arthur Miller's A View from the Bridge. Set in 1950s Brooklyn, the play explores the pursuit of the American dream, irrational love, and betrayal. The Broadway production originated in London, where it won an Olivier Award for Best Revival. Ben Brantley of the New York Times, the powerful drama critic, wrote, Mr. Strong is the most powerful single performance you're likely to see this year. He also has a busy film career, often playing villainous characters. Here's a look at some of his most haunting roles. They attacked us on land in 98, by sea in 2000, and from the air in 2001. They murdered 3,000 of our citizens in cold blood. And they have slaughtered our forward deployed. And what the fuck have we done about it, huh? Congratulations. My warmest welcome to His Majesty's service. If you speak a word of what I'm about to show you, you will be executed for high treason. You will lie to your friends, your family, and everyone you meet about what it is you really do. I have returned from beyond the grave to fulfill England's destiny and extend the boundaries of this great empire. Listen to the rabble outside. Listen to the fear. I will use that as a weapon to control them and then the world. He's traveling in Beirut. It's dangerous to travel. He'll disappear. I want you to take him from his hotel, drug him, put him in the front of a car, and run a truck into him at 50 miles an hour. It's good to have you back in town, Bob. I am pleased to have Mark Strong at this table for the first time. It's a pleasure and welcome. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, tell me how this began for you. I got a call, uh, having not done a play for about 12 years. I know. Uh, Which from... surprised me because you began in theater. I did. I trained for the theater. I did a lot of theater at the beginning. Yeah. I've, I've worked at the Royal Shakespeare Company, the National Theater, right. um, all the theaters in London. And but, I think. But so just stay with that one second. So you hadn't been on stage for 12 years because you had so many interesting film roles? Or because you were pursuing a film career or something else? Uh, I think uh, I had done so much theatre and it was a kind of genre I was very familiar with and I didn't really know about film. And contemporaries of mine were making films and doing films and it was a world that I realised that I could have access to. I just didn't know how. Yeah. And then I got a couple of roles that... Um, got me started, if you like, and once I was in the club, it's uh, it's very hard not to continue with that, and uh, before I knew it, 12 years ago. Yeah, one performance by. leads to another, etc. Quite, yeah. 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 And so what happened? You got a call finally, and somebody said, you can't, I have an offer you can't refuse. Yeah, well, uh, David Lern at the Young Vic uh, asked to see me, and I went in to talk to him, and he'd... Uh, He'd sent me a view from the bridge, which was in a pile of film scripts that I'd been yeah. looking at and was head and shoulders above everything I was reading. Just spoke to you? Yep, and said... What uh, was it that spoke to you? That's very hard. That's an interesting question. It's very hard to say why a character really speaks to you because mm -hmm. it's instinctive. It's something that I just felt. I kind of knew who this guy was. I knew how I wanted to play him. I knew from what I'd read what kind of a guy... I thought he, he is. And then I would... I read about it. I'd never seen the play. I'd read it at... Um, university but then I looked into it and uh, I realized he's played one way but I read something a little bit different and thought I'd really like to have a go at that you describe this as a slow-motion car crash mm. set up the play so we understand why it's a slow-motion car crash you're a guy who works on the docks in late 40s early 50s yeah it would be early 50s yeah. he's a he's a longshoreman right he is married and has uh, his wife's sister's daughter, who he's been bringing up since she was a baby, her niece. Right. And they live together in a, a tiny apartment, and uh, it's all been going pretty well. When we meet them, the girl is now 17. She's kind of on the cusp of womanhood. And we learn that two Sicilian immigrants, cousins of his wife, have been invited to come and stay in the house because they've been brought in by the syndicate to work on the docks illegally. One of the young men and the girl fall in love with each other and all hell breaks loose. Right. Because he thinks somehow 
Uh, he thinks that she simply wants, that he wants to marry her because he wants to uh, get entry into the United States. Yeah, well, it's incredibly complicated. I mean, that's why Miller's writing is so brilliant, because it's, there's a number of things going on. Eddie's reason for not liking him is that he's just after his papers. Right, that's his point. Yeah, yeah. but some people interpret the fact that he's jealous of the guy, yeah. that he's interested in the girl inappropriately. Right. Um, Suggest that he's gay and all that. Yeah, that, I mean, there's so many different kind of levels on which you can play this. And what's fantastic about the production that we've done, I think, is that it releases it. It releases it from history. It releases Arthur Miller from just being a playwright we all think we know, with convenient plays about the 50s, all done uh, in a 50s style. And uh, it's a very bare, stark production that uh, American friends of mine have said is the clearest version they've ever seen. This is the clearest version. I agree. It's staged in an interesting way, too. I mean, the stage is bare. Yeah. A, a trademark of this director. Yeah. And, and the two, the audience is on either side on the stage. Yes. And you sit there in just a square. Yeah. You're all barefooted. Yeah. What's that about? Well, that's an interesting question. We uh, didn't start barefoot. We had shoes initially. Yeah. And then Ivo Van Hover, the director, came in. I think it was the end of the first week and said, I just want you all to get rid of your shoes. And we couldn't understand why that was. I think in retrospect, looking at it, it's something about the space that he created for us to perform in. It's a very pristine space. The floor is white. Um, what goes on in that space is revealed by a huge monolithic kind of stone edifice disappearing at the beginning so that you reveal these people and that same thing comes in at the end. Mm. And it means that the, the arena or Petri dish or boxing ring or whatever it is that he's created there, that stage, is where we perform and enact this play, stroke story, stroke ritual. And I think not having shoes means it connects us to the ground, it makes the thing rather special, mm. but it also uh, does something very special, which is it stops the need for the play to be real. We're not trying to persuade everybody that what they're seeing is real. You can see the audience on the stage, you can see we haven't got shoes so on. So you're saying this is theatre? Quiet. Yeah. It's, it's about the words, the narrative, the characters, not about the need to persuade everybody that what they're seeing is real. Mm. The other interesting thing is there is a lawyer, Alfieri, is that, mm -hmm. is that am I yeah. saying that right? Yeah. Uh, who is, in a sense, our guide. Yeah. He tells us from the beginning. You know, and Brantley, in fact, in his review said, you know, he was terrific and it's essential to the play. Sure. Well, that's the slow motion car crash that you're right. talking about is... Uh, was set on that course by the lawyer who basically appears and says, OK, here's a story. Right. This, is, this is what's going to happen. Yeah. And then you watch it happen. And essentially, that's the kind of ingredient of tragedy, that you know that the character, central character, has hubris, that the gods are going to be displeased, that it's not going to end well, but you watch what happens in order to make that kind of cataclysmic event take yeah. place at the end of the play. Um, in, in which there's life and death. Yeah. Uh, you also ponder the question as to whether your character, Eddie Carbone, has something beyond just uh, being a substitute father. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's partly physical sure. because of the way she comes and jumps up into his, on the top of his legs, and, 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 and it's clearly, she's very affectionate with him. It's been played that way, you know, this, yeah. the, there is a sexual interest in the girl. Right. Personally, I think he's in love with her. He's infatuated by her. She's 17 years old now. I think he doesn't have the emotional ability to articulate how he feels or why he feels the way he does. He just loves cuddling her. He's been doing it since she was a, a baby. I have sons rather than daughters. Yeah. And I've asked a number of fathers who have daughters, you know, how do, is, does there a point come in your daughter's life where you suddenly become aware of her sexually? And they, they tend to glaze over at that point, yeah. and that's a very difficult question to answer. Sure. But it's in that arena. Because you have to define what that means. Well, quite. And I yeah. think it's that arena that there is a, a grown man in the house who, has this young girl on the cusp of womanhood yeah. and who loves lots of time together yeah she loves cuddling him she's right. practicing her sexuality in a safe environment he's stroking her leg everybody in the theater including his wife and they including can including his wife is an important point yeah they can see it's inappropriate yeah. the only two people in the whole building who don't two realize that are the, the two, two of them. them you have to bear in mind it was originally called an italian tragedy this play right. so the italian element is very strong the idea that eddie wants respect that he needs his name at the end of the play, which a lot of Miller's uh, uh, protagonists do. But more importantly than that, he's an Italian Catholic who's promised a dying woman, and he says it three or four times during the play, that he's responsible for Catherine, the mother of the girl, that he's going to take care of her. 
And into their lives come this boy that he cannot quantify. He works on the docks with guys who don't really speak to each other. His friend Lewis says to him at one point, I mean, it's one of my favorite lines, I mean, what the hell, you know? Yeah. And Eddie replies, sure. Yeah. That's how men talk to each other on the docks. They don't come talking about bu buying records and jackets and blue motorcycles, all the plans that this young boy has. They talk about almost... They, are you okay? I'm okay. You yeah, are, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that heavy? That's heavy. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I'll see you later. You okay. know, they literally, yeah. they don't really speak with each other. And this boy, this articulate boy, arrives in their house, has an interest in the girl, and all Eddie knows He's is... He's an immigrant, an illegal immigrant, who's yeah. come in, and they're giving refuge to him. Sure. You know, to keep them from anybody knowing. Yeah, and the alarm bells go off in Eddie's head that this guy is not right. You know, he's not right for the girl. He's not what he promised her dying mother that, um, yeah. you know, she would end... Uh, the, guy, the kind of guy she would end up with. So right. it just... He cannot... Quant it might as well be a Martian, this yeah. guy. So he could have... I mean, just back to the affection he feels for her. It could be he'd very well... He never felt that kind of sexual attraction. Uh, and it... He just simply wants to take care of her. He wants to be protective of her. Mm -hmm. Or it could be, secondly, that he does feel it, but he knows it's a bridge too far. He knows yeah. he can't do that and be faithful to the dying promise he made. And, sure. and, or, and, or, or that he feels it, but can't articulate it or even yeah. understand it. So what's interesting is I don't play in my mind, and the actor has to make the choice, I yes. think, how you're going to play it, whether you are interested in her or not, inappropriately. You don't make that choice. I have the choice I've made for myself. He's aware that she's interesting to other men. He says, I don't like the looks they're giving you in the candy yeah, store. Right. With them new high heels on the sidewalk. Yeah. Clack, clack, clack. The heads yeah. are turning like windmills. So he's aware that others are looking. That's the line. Yeah, it's That's wonderful. Good. <laughs> oh, boy, um, but he's not looking. What he's seeing is their response. And I genuinely think, again, coming to that thing of fathers and daughters, I think a father can see another male's interest in his daughter, but not necessarily feel that particular feeling yeah, himself. Yeah, yeah. And that's where, that's the arena that I think Eddie occupies. Yeah. What is it you want your performance to achieve? Hmm. Is it the ambivalence? Well, Miller's writing has the ambivalence. Right. My job is to play my own truth. So what I want to achieve with my performance is playing the truth of Eddie Carbone as I see him. So this in is every a difference in a playwright and an actor, how are the roles of a playwright and an actor? The, it, there is a difference because I play it a particular way, but other people, friends of mine who've come to see the play, have said to me, "You are interested in her, aren't you?" And I said, "No, I'm not." And they went, no, no, but I said that to you when I said that. Exactly, yeah. and so they're perceiving something that I'm not playing. Right. So there is a level that exists, which is the writing, which is Miller. Yeah asking you as an audience to see what you think about the situation. But there is a level... So he's actually asking the audience, everyone, knowing that they will be anyway. What do you think of this? That, in a nutshell, I think, is the purpose of theatre. When I was lucky enough to win the Olivier Award back right. home, I hadn't really prepared a speech because, to be honest, I, I, I've been nominated for things in the past. I'd never won anything. I was just happy to be there. I didn't really think of it in those terms. And my name came up. I went up and collected the award, and I hadn't genuinely thought about what to say. A week before, a 12-year-old boy this had come... This is the equivalent of a Tony Award, I assume. Yes, right. yeah. Um, and a week before, a, a young boy had come round with his mother to the stage door. And, by the way, lots of people used to come to the stage door to want to talk about the play. And this boy was obviously very bored with his mother talking. He went, what's the point of theatre? He said, what's the point of theatre? And um, I couldn't answer him in the moment, but I went away and thought about it. And I think that that's the nub of the issue. Why are we still going into a room, switching the lights off, watching a bunch of people pretending to be other people live right. and still coming away talking about it. And what we need from live experiences is, is the ability to sit there and judge ourselves against what we're seeing. So people are going, would I behave like Eddie? Does he make the right choice? What's he thinking? What's she doing? Why is she behaving like that? And in doing that, we're asking ourselves what it means to be human. You said, quote, I discovered that there's a purpose to theatre. The reason it's been around for a couple of thousand years is because it has value. Yeah. And the value is it makes you think and yeah. feel and ask yourself questions about what you just saw. Absolutely. And the purpose of art, all creativity really, isn't it? To take us out of our everyday lives, to stop us worrying about emails and bills and yeah. the stuff of life, the rat race, you know, just survival. Isn't art and all painting, music, 
novel, everything. It's to take us somewhere else and make us think about stuff. But is your role uh, in terms of an individual character to make them uh, understood, to help us understand the way you portray them? We know who Eddie Carbone is. We know what drives him, if, if we're listening and watching carefully. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and having played a lot of villains, yeah. that's an interesting dilemma because, you know, villains aren't supposed to be likable. Yeah, but every actor that I know plays villains, uh, most of them have always said, I try to find something about them exactly. that's interesting. You have to make them understood. Yeah. If you can understand the motivation of a bad guy, yeah. he becomes a little more accessible than somebody who's just downright evil. And Eddie, Miller said about Eddie, we should weep no tears for Eddie. And that's ironic because a lot of people are in tears at the end of the play. Yeah, I know they are. They find it very moving. They really feel for what's yeah. happened. And I asked somebody they today, I idea. said, are you feeling for Catherine, for her loss, yeah. or for Eddie and his mistakes? And they said both. Yeah. And so it's incredibly emotional, this, this journey that you go on with us all. And um, the fact that at the end there are people who are incredibly moved by it. This is two hours without intermission. Yes. Uh, you're in almost every scene. Yes. Almost. How hard is it to do that? It, it's exhilarating and incredibly exhausting and difficult. But once draining. You're, yeah, but once you're in it, it just grabs you by the throat. Yeah. This play. Every it night. Drags every single night, every single performance. Ironically, just before the play starts, I usually feel at my tiredest. I think, how are we going to climb the mountain yeah. again? Right. And every single performance, there's a point where I think, wow, God, we're in the middle of it again. And by the end, you know, we've, we've, uh, we've performed the play. Have all of your aspirations for acting been fulfilled? Uh, not yet. No. There's still a way to go. These are characters or just professional achievement? Learning, you know. Oh, learning. Just with every new play and every new job and every new group of actors that you work with and every new director and mm. you learn something new, something else comes about. And just when you think you know how to do it and you know what you're doing, mm. you challenge yourself and something else happens. And... But um, I want to keep that happening. Yeah. Because you did television, yes. and then you said no more television. Yeah, well, what happens in the UK, I don't know if it's the same in, in America, but having done theatre and trained for the theatre, that's kind of a club. And once you're in the theatre and people watching you in plays, they offer you other plays, and you tend to oh. do that. And then if a TV comes along that's a success, you'll get lots of offers in television, and you think, oh, well, I'll, I'll do that. And that's kind of what happened to me. I spent sort of ten years doing theatre, and then about sort of ten years doing television, and then the movies came calling. And people saw movies and said, oh, we, you know, we like that guy. And so I was suddenly in the movie club. So mm -hmm. you don't tend to move very much yeah. between them in the beginning. Now, after this, I'm off to do a movie, and then I'd love to do another play again. What kind of character? I see myself as a character actor. What I love about theatre is transformation. Right. I love taking things on that are not me, yeah. to get as far away from myself as I can, whether it's an accent, a piece of costume, a wig, a you know, superhero makeup, whatever it is. Yeah. Anything that moves me away from myself, I, I just don't know why. When I started out acting, those were the parts I gravitated to, something that made you different. I don't know how I would play myself and be a lover yeah. and a hero. And also, the UK and America have very different... Um, attitudes I think to characters I think here you revere the hero yeah. you revere the guy that can throw a punch you know grin yeah. kiss the girl win the day we have Richard III Macbeth but, but, exactly, you know, Coriolanus yeah. yes, we, you exactly. know our, our tradition yeah, yeah, is yeah, yeah. is not so focused on on the hero or the leading man tell me the best lesson you ever got about acting um, um, or, or what is in essence what has been for you the thing that you hung on to that made you as good as you are? That's a lovely compliment. I, I, I just see that my job is to believe, you know, create truth. Because when you watch people and you believe that they are connected to what they're doing and you believe what they're doing, it's riveting, fascinating. Think of documentaries where people are interviewed about real life events. There's something riveting about somebody mm -hmm. talking about something that's happened. And, you know, if you can create that in fiction, and make it believable and truthful and um, absorbing, that's the best thing. I mean, there are a lot of practical things as well. I always remember a drama school. Uh, I was at the same drama school as Daniel Day-Lewis, actually, right, who right. who's married to Rebecca Miller, yes. who came to see the play right, the other day. Right. And we reminisced a little. We had a teacher who, who said, uh, he said, imagine it says on the front of the stage, don't look here. 
So there were loads of practical, because obviously the audience is out there. You need to be looking out there. You shouldn't ever be kind of looking down here. In this role of Eddie Carbone, did you go to the docks? I mean, how did you prepare for this? I felt him instinctively. I mean, I uh, I went down to Red Hook, had a look, yeah, and Red it's, Hook it's uh, a great, interesting it's place. It's amazing. It's yeah. very bleak there on the yeah. water. Right. And it's wonderful to look back to Manhattan. There's a line in the play where he says to Catherine, you know, I want you to be in the lawyer's office, maybe in one of those, someplace in New York. And, yeah. he, and I, I always pointed... He wanted her to be a secretary. That's right. And I always used to point when we were in London, and I didn't quite know why. And then I went to Red Hook and looked, yeah, and there are the buildings, and it kind of yeah. suddenly brought it all into focus for me. Thank you for coming. Pleasure to have you here. It was lovely to talk about it. Thank uh, you. A View from the Bridge is going to be on for how long? Until February the 21st, another five weeks or so. You heard it here, another five weeks. <laughs>